Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. A happy Christmas Eve if this is a particular uh, festival that you celebrate. And if it isn't, happy 24th of December. Have a great day, whatever. So, whoa, I've got an itchy ear. <sighs> oh, so tired earlier. get much I didn't um, it wasn't so much I didn't get much sleep I just woke up early yesterday and decided to go out and do some stuff I needed to get some shopping and stuff like that for Christmas well not for Christmas just to cover the air the t- to cover the period when the shops are closed which is two days you know it's not really anything is it it's uh what is it today it's Tuesday does that mean Christmas is tomorrow wow how ridiculous just gone so quick so tomorrow Wednesday is Christmas day and then Thursday, the day after, is Boxing Day. And then that's it. Until... I suppose next Tuesday would be New Year's Eve. And then New Year's Day on Wednesday. And then Thursday will be back to normal. A second, yeah, a second of... January, a new, a new decade. Is it a new decade or a new century? I don't know. New, new decade, <laughs> new decade. Um, two thousand and twenty. Oh. So that would be. I'm gonna say that'll be interesting, but I don't know if if it is, is it? I suppose it would be interesting to see what this decade involved, but as far as decades go, I've not really ever took much notice of new decades apart from the turn of the century you know 1999 to 2000 that's the only because that was uh, a big deal you know everyone was not everyone but the press were talking about it and you know the uh, I actually remember I sat in and watched I saw the new year in with my cousin's boyfriend I've got no idea where my cousin was she must have been out but we were just in watching telly watching the fireworks you know waiting for the planes to fall out of the sky and you know everything to cut off because we're supposed to have that um Millennium bug thing that was supposed to kick in and nothing happened. It was just oh, and I remember like you know a minute into the new year, the new decade, the new century. I didn't really feel that much different. <laughs> How weird! Wow. So yeah, it was. Uh, 
that's the only decade, the changing decade that I've really took notice of. When we moved into 2011, didn't even really notice it. Two thousand eleven, two thousand and ten. Yeah, it's two thousand ten. That'd be a new decade. One of them. Was it? Yeah. yeah. And now two thousand and twenty, which will be in a week's time. This is kind of. Hmm. Does it actually have any meaning? <laughs> I don't know. It's like anything, I suppose, isn't it? The only meaning really anything has is the meaning we give to it. So, I've always been, I say always, I haven't always anything, but I've always kind of preferred New Year's Day or you know the new year to any other um, forced celebration that uh, occurs in my society I just prefer it I prefer something about a new start kind of thing you know a new, a new year, a new start, possible, um, yeah, making changes, but I don't recall, I don't even remember last year like the New Year's Eve I think uh, I was watching I remember New Year's Day because I had some random knocking on my door asking to borrow money which was a bit weird it's not the start of my New Year that I wanted um, but New Year's Eve, I don't remember. I think it was just standard watching telly, watching the fireworks on the is it Big Ben or wherever uh, the fireworks were. And see, when I was younger, <laughs> the amount of times I've started with that sentence, when I was younger. When I was just a young man, I, from the ages of, well, I'll say the year, this chair really is squeaky. I'm trying not to move around, but the chair just seems to be squeaking on its own. But I've got no there's no choice really there's nothing else I can do I don't want to stand up and do the recording um, so New Year's Eve 1991 which would be New Year's Day would be 1992 you know so that so 1991 New Year's Eve I think I was at the comedy club and I think I was there every year up to 1995 I wasn't I was a girlfriend's with a girlfriend 
1996 I was very likely working I can't no I don't remember don't remember 1996 no but 97 I was at the comedy club 98 99 2000 2001 probably most of 2000 as well 2002 2003 maybe not 2000 and f- not 2006 because I was with a girlfriend possibly not 2005 no 2005 New Year's Eve I was with a girlfriend because I saw the New Year in with her in her um, and then I was 2006 I had New Year's Eve with a girl different girlfriend Two thousand and four, two thousand and seven I probably went to the comedy club again in London I went a few more times because I used to Sometimes I'd stay with my friend, other times I'd uh, get a hotel. I think sometimes I'd go and just come back the same day, you know, get the get the train back. Although I don't know if that... There are trains New Year's Day because people have to get about, don't they? So I'm pretty sure there would have been a train coming back. So most of my New Year's Eves throughout my adult life up to the last probably apart from the last seven or eight years was uh, celebrated in a comedy club and it might sound a bit boring but it wasn't just uh, comedy this was a nightclub and the great atmosphere the the comedy would be on but it wouldn't be like an ordinary night it would be you know it would be well, New Year's Eve it was a more very more celebratory and after the comedy there'd be a disco and back in them days especially during the 90s or 2000s as well um, the comedians from all over London not all of them but a lot a lot would actually end up at the comedy club because it would be open later than the others because of the nightclub so they'd end up coming back at, I don't know, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, going to the club, hanging out. There was a comics room upstairs. Um, and in the early days, there was a big, big room with a uh, pool table, a uh, big TV, uh, settees, you know, um, sofas and stuff like that, darts board. And... Um, yeah, it's a really good hangout area where people uh, did hang out at the bar downstairs as well and sit downstairs and then in the after hours when the club closed at two they'd sort of still stick around for the rest of the night sometimes uh, either downstairs or upstairs so yeah it used to be it was nice But New Year's Eve was quite 
quite special. The only thing I never really was into on New Year's Eve was the, uh, you know, the bit where everyone kind of ding, ding, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! And maybe sing Old Lang Syne. Old man, old man, and people, you know, no one knows more than like two sentences of that song. So I used to just hide during that bit. Yeah. Sometimes I'd go upstairs and I'd sit in my squeaky chair upstairs. I've always had a squeaky chair carry it around with me. And I'd, w- I'd wait until all the party poppers had been let off and, you know, everyone had been hugging each other and stuff. And then, f- and then the music started and, you know, people were, like, dancing again. So I kind of... Then I'd come downstairs, safe from human contact. <laughs> It's a, I used to quite like it. It was my. It was almost like it was my safe space, you know. Going there, I knew people. I knew. You know, I got to know the staff, the person that owned the place. Uh, you know, I got to know the comedians. Uh, not all of them, but quite a few even if it was just just to say hello like not just to say hello but just just to say hello and I say you alright and I say yeah <laughs> how you doing yeah so yeah I had some good conversations it was good and uh, got to know a few people that were already famous like not not like best friends with them, but I got to know them a little bit. Like Joe Brand, I actually annoyed her. Um, I don't know what I did, but it was in nineteen ninety one, and she used to hang out at the bar, and I used to just talk to her because I knew that she was she was already been on TV and done stand-up comedy in the late 80s, you know, so she was already pretty much a star, and, uh, yeah, I upset her once, and she had a go at me, told me off, and she didn't talk to me after that, so, oh, brilliant, I can, I can annoy, <laughs> I can annoy famous people now as, as well, my superpower has no no limits. And who else did I get to know? I know I can't think of any if I I used to like be chatty with Harry Hill in the early nineties. But but that was before he was famous. Um I used to say hi to Lee Evans, but again, that was just kind of a hello, how are you, sort of, to be fair, I think he did it with everyone, he just, he just a really friendly person, and again, that was before he was famous as well, another person, Jack D, who was already kind of on the he was already kind of famous when I first met him. And I did a gig on the same night as him. And because even, even comedians that are on TV, they still go to clubs to try out new material or just extra money or whatever. You know, still still perform, a lot of them. And <laughs> I walked up to 
to um, Jack D. I was so excited. And I said to him, I said, Can I, hello, I'm Jason, I'm, you know, I love you. And he said, get away from me. And it was nice to be around someone who was shorter than me. I don't mean I don't meet many men that are actually shorter than he is. He's about five five one, four, four, six, something like that. He's 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 quite I think pretty up to my nipples. He is <laughs> he is he's like nipple level. No he's not. He's he is shorter than me, but probably it might be like fractions. But I don't. Well, everything's fractions, isn't it? If you work it like that way. But he's yeah. He really wasn't friendly. <laughs> he's it's like a little. He was like a little um, pit bull terrier, kind of a bit little but vicious, you know. So. He wasn't horrible to me, but I said, would you like a drink? He said, no. <laughs> Not no, or no thank you, probably, but... And I was like, oh... Like, you know, it is said, don't meet your heroes, but... He wasn't my hero, he just... He was someone that I admired. And he was... One of the biggest names on the comedy circuit. Who was obviously going to go on to be famous and you know a uh, big name but he and he had already been on TV but I don't think he had his own TV show by, at that point but he'd you know, been on TV doing stand up so that's one I, I used to be um, I almost stalked Mark Thomas, he's a comedian and brilliant comedian. He's I don't know if he still does stand up because he's he's written books and done TV shows and stuff like that. What was it the Mark Mark Thomas Project or something that he did? And but he actually gave me his telephone number, and I when I saw that he was on at a club that I couldn't just get in because most comedy clubs I could just get in and they knew me um, but there were some that I couldn't like jonglers didn't know who I was um, that comedy store didn't really know who I was but most of the comedy clubs in London were just little clubs there were some bigger um, nights but they weren't Purposely, I think the term is purposely built comedy club, where that's all that happens there is comedy. There's jonglers, comedy store, there was the comedy cafe, there might be a couple of others. There was the backyard comedy club, which was Lee Hurst's club. I don't know if it's still there, that was in East London. And I didn't. Other, no, all the other clubs mainly were just rooms in pubs but when I say rooms in pubs sometimes they were huge rooms holding hundreds and hundreds of people you know for a, for a room in a pub you'd think it'd be quite small maybe hold maybe 30, 40 and I've been in rooms like that that held maybe 20 or 30 but there was other places like Banana Cabaret which had, it was a big room, and they'd have like top, well, the, all the clubs would have top acts to be fair, um, but it would be a, a well paid gig, I think, and it was a big room. And then there was the Meccano Club, which was a big room, it wasn't like massive, but it was hugely respected. And I think that was in. Ah, oh, not Ilford. Um, it was in a trendy area of London at the time. Is, is Islington maybe? 
and the Meccano Club it was run by this I forget her name it's a lady and she used to let me do gigs there and so she was she was nice didn't pay me but just like a lot of other people she got to know me she, she knew me so she I could turn up on a Friday night or Saturday night whenever the gig was on and just go and watch the show and I wouldn't get charged which was lovely you know it gave me you know throughout the 90s from 91 to pretty much to 2001 I could go to most comedy clubs and get in for free and just watch the show because either I knew the people that owned the club who run it or I'd know the comedians that were performing or I just had to say is I'm a comic and they just let me in and most people had heard of me because I had a, a bad reputation for being awful <laughs> I was <laughs> unfortunately and also I was in the paper there was a newspaper article about me in the independent and about how some of the things I was saying was just terrible and I was quite quite a harsh comedian at times uh, quite, I don't know if you want to say adult entertainment or whatever but yeah, so I was known not necessarily for the right reasons but you know, the thing is some of the comedy club owners were really nice in a sense of they, they'd just be very blatant and they'd say Jason you're welcome to come here anytime to come and watch the show or even to perform but you're never ever ever going to get paid <laughs> we're never we're never ever going to pay you <laughs> it's, like, it's like okay fair enough at least they're honest I mean, it's a bit a little bit limiting but so with Mark Thomas I used to I went and saw him at the comedy store and he put me on the door list on a like visitors list so I could get in for free because comedy store is expensive and although I suppose every comedian loves the comedy store in a sense of it's the it was the place to be it was pretty much the most famous comedy club in the country possibly in the world you know the comedy store there's a comedy store in America as well isn't there and but there might be more famous ones in America I don't know but in England the comedy store is the longest running comedy club it's been going since the late 70s and they have moved a dress a couple of times and it was above it was actually below uh, I think like a strip club or something or a sex shop or something like that in so it's you know it's in a kind of I don't use the word seedy part of London because I used to frequent it but yeah I suppose it is quite seedy but at the same time really popular because I don't think it was in the same place when I moved to London in 91 it moved it was actually in um, Leicester Square which if you've never been to Leicester Square I, mean, I don't know what it's like now as I've been out of I've been out of the London loop since 2001 I've visited, still visited for you know quite a few years, but I really, really, really go to London these days. And as far as going to Leicester Square on a Friday or Saturday early morning, you know, sort of two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or Sunday morning, I haven't done that since I was in my twenties. But I used to do it regularly because it was brilliant. I mean, it's it's weird to be walking around, uh, you know, like I said, one o'clock in the morning, 
and it could be five o'clock in the afternoon for the amount of people that are there and the activity and not even I don't even recall ever seeing much in the way of drunken activity or you know commotion or anything people just seem to be just having fun you know a lot of tourists there taking photographs and that was before selfies existed that's before blimey that's before mobile phones even existed really like normal definitely before smartphones <laughs> I got my first mobile phone that's a cell phone for those of you that call them cell phones in I think it was the winter 1997 but I did have a girlfriend who had a mobile phone in 96 while I was with her and she was a student so she got this phone and it was seemed to do the trick seemed to sort of work but they were just for phoning and I guess you could text on them but there was no the internet didn't really exist at that point not in a kind of the way that we know it mind you it didn't exist the way that we know it until recently because it's always getting updated isn't it God, this, this is even more boring than I expected it to be. I did, um... Will it snow on Christmas Day? That's the question. Never ever... During my remembrance... In my memory... During my life, have I ever... Woken up to snow... It actually snowing... On Christmas Day. Never. However, I have woken up to snow on the ground. Which you could say is sun like pretty much the same thing, really. But it's not. You know, something about the the actual act of snowing rather than there was snow you know because when I first moved to this town to do when I did my start my university course in 2007 I think it was September or, or yeah probably about that that Christmas or that winter very snowy we had two very snowy snowy winters in a row and it was still snowing I think Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve something like that but Christmas Day didn't snow at all but it snowed so much that it was thick snow outside and I don't know if I'd appreciate snow if I had no choice. You know, if I lived somewhere where there is, you know, feet and feet of snow, if, well, not snow, feet made of snow, but, you know, f a huge amounts of snow all the time, everywhere, the novelty might run out. But at Christmas, I don't know, not even just Christmas, but when it does snow, we don't think we had any snow last year at all, but if, when it does snow, it's just, it's beautiful. I, I just, I find it to be beautiful. It's the most, even in London, so I don't remember it, I think it snowed, like really, really snowed, proper snowed in 1991, the winter. And 
I was in London the previous oh, in eighty nine. I'd spent the winter there working, and then I left, and I came back in ninety one in January. But by the winter, the next winter, I think it was, unless it was actually just after I moved in, but I'm pretty sure it was like later in the year, the snow was really thick, like really proper snow. And I lived in East London. It's not the prettiest place in the world. You know, it's just, it's just houses, cars and roads and pavements and people. It's not, you know, it's, I suppose like anywhere, I guess, but when there's snow on the ground and everything's, it almost feels like London was clean and the the roads were clean and the pavements were clean, the cars were clean and I don't know, it just seemed, even the air seemed cleaner. I mean, besides, there was very little in the way of traffic because the cars couldn't get through the amount of snow there was. But I liked it a lot. Because, I don't know, where I lived, London was just... There wasn't anything wrong with it. It's... I suppose because I'd lived in a little town that was, I wouldn't say pretty, a pretty little town, but it was it was a, a fairly, um, yeah, a fairly decent little town, as far as the, the spacing went, you know, the pavements were fairly wide. The roads are big enough. There's um, houses, but they weren't like squashed together. There's a little bit of space, and the space was used up. But it was, I don't know, it, was, it seemed to work. Plus, it was near a beach, so there was fresh air. You know, there was. Uh, that sea air coming in all the time, which was fairly nice, but a little bit chilly though. Ooh, it was chilly at times. Oh, there was once, when I was in the, my last job, when I was uh, selling car insurance online, on, online on the phone and I started working there <sighs> I started working there in 11, 12 I think it was December 2012 I think and from I would say January, February, March, April every month I was there up to April including April there was snow I've never known it to snow so many months in a row. I mean, it, it would clear, then it'd snow again the next month. But there's a heck of a lot of snow. And I used to say to customers on the phone, Ooh, is it... I don't know if I said ooh, but I said, Is it snowing where you are? And they'd, they'd answer yes or no, depending upon whether it was snowing where they were and the person next to me that I was working with gradually got more and more wound up with hearing me 
repeat that sentence to people and I did it I said it to it once I knew it was winding him up I did it more because I was going to do it anyway it's it's a good thing it's a nice little icebreaker you know talking about the weather and stuff like that and he's just like will you stop talking about the snow and I I said you know it's it's snowing where you are but then instead of just saying snowing I'm actually leaning lean into him so he could really hear me is it snowing I cuddle him is it snowing where you are and so after the disciplinary and I kind of thought maybe I'd stop doing it but I couldn't stop myself and then it stopped snowing so I did or so everyone thought I started saying is it sunny where you are is it windy where you are it's very windy here so I'd uh, that snow though every month got snow the year before as well because I remember I was living on a hill I was in this uh, room that I'd rented I was there for about a year and the beginning of 2012 I remember this because I was dating someone from Romania and I don't think she'd ever seen snow before and which I don't know if that's true but she, anyway she loved snow she got excited and she phoned me up and said uh, I don't know what she said I never really understood what she was talking about she was Romanian I didn't know what she was what she said but she we liked each other so that was that was the main thing um, turned out she only ever wanted directions I thought she wanted to go out for and on a on a date so I kind of misunderstood but it worked out okay and uh, and she moved back to Amsterdam she had a, a job or something to go to so I haven't seen her since so um, oh there was this one when I was in um, this room when I was at university there was this little girl she wasn't a girl she was an adult but she was absolutely tiny and she was from I don't even know Sudan or somewhere like that she was um, I think she was a refugee I Mm. think I didn't ask because I didn't care but she she was absolutely miniature um, apart from well not all of her was but see if you look at it you could tell, tell she was a woman but she just was she was so short um, probably up to my belly button or something and she really couldn't have been more than about five foot I'd say and she had her clothes left on the on the radiator and I'm not normally one to sort of look at other people's clothing and stuff but I had to I had because there were these little pair of jeans and I had to look and they were the size of a 10 year old that's what size jeans she had I can't state enough she did not look like a child she just was um, the height and probably the weight of a child mind you I think she probably weighed a lot heavier than she looked Um, but she it's hard to tell isn't it from looking at someone how much they weigh she wouldn't have weighed much but um, it's like yeah it's, it's not I've never seen anyone like that before and with those kind of proportions just so tiny and I felt like a giant standing next to her anyway that's not really what the story's about the story is 
it was snowing we had a lot of snow when she was there and she went out and she'd never seen snow before because she'd come from a country that didn't really have snow and she built a snowman and I was just watching through the window thinking how cute how to, to be excited that's something that I suppose I'm just used to even though it doesn't snow like guaranteed it's going to snow every year it's snowed many many times through my life so seeing snow isn't an, an unusual thing and she was seen so happy and you know in retrospect I perhaps she could have gone out there and helped her with a snowman but I didn't want to go outside and get my feet wet yeah and it was weird because she moved out and and I sort of said well what are you doing she said I'm moving out so I saw that they were loading a lorry outside or a move, removal van or whatever and I said why and she said well I've got no friends I've got no friends here and I'd made no attempt really to be friends with her just because I was just busy doing my own thing and, and I just like and she gave me a big hug I mean, she went. I was like, oh. See, I think she's moving to London. I think London would be, probably be the best place for her to meet people because there's so many people in London that it's, it's, it's hard not to meet people if you actually do stuff. You know, and she was going to be going to college and stuff like that. So, and... You know, I hope, you know, I hope that it's been a long time since I last saw her, but I hope she's had a good time and she's, she knows she could be married with children now. She could be, what year was that? 2000 and, 2000 and, probably 2010. 2009, 2010 so yeah it's not nearly 10 years and she was probably about 22 at that point so now she's 32 who, who knows where she is she might be she might have moved back to the Sudan or wherever it was she originated I'd be I never asked but what was strange is she had this bloke that was I don't know if he was a kind of carer social worker immigrations officer I really don't know who he was but he was one of the tallest people I've ever seen in my life well, at least seven foot at least and standing next to her, it just looked like some kind of comic character. Because she was really short and he was really, really tall. So they were both completely out of proportion with each, with each other and the rest of uh, humankind, really. Because there's very few women of her height. I mean, she might have even been less than five foot. And he was at least seven, if not higher, taller. It's, you know he was really huge but only not body wise just length you know not girth, not girth just length and uh, and when he was in her bedroom they were giggling and stuff so I don't know what they were up to I did think oh it doesn't sound very professional 
It doesn't sound like a f professional relationship to me. And uh, I did nearly ask her once, just to make sure she was okay. But uh, I remember there was something on telly I wanted to watch. So. I'm trying to think of other times, snow. When I was really young, there was snow, and all the schools were closed, and I was about eight years old, and it came up to about my waist back then. So, but, you know, I was little, so probably, maybe the snow was about three foot. Possibly, yeah. And, yeah. And me and my brothers, we made igloos in the garden, in the back garden. Made snowmen. That's that. Once it's done, it's done, isn't it? And then we, I think our dad took a slow, um, snowboarding or, what, you know, on a slide, a plastic slide. I didn't want to do it. Just, yeah, didn't fancy it at all. So I just watched, didn't actually do it. Never been a big fan of uh, extreme sports. to live dangerously I'd, uh, I'd buy a kebab I don't I just I like to play things nice and safe if at all possible yes Myself feeling really tired. this sometimes when I'm making a recording of my brain just twitches off 